Hello, guys. It's nice, it's nice uh, to see you all here today. Uh, I'm uh, Chief Revenue Officer at Azure Games. My name is Maxim. I've been working at Azure Games for five years already, so it is a pretty long and happy time together. Uh, at Azure Games, I am responsible for ad monetization, for uh, user acquisition, for analytics, BI development, and all the integrations. But today, I will mostly speak about analytics. Uh, today, in our reports, we talk about how games become more complicated, how player requirements for the quality and quantity of content grow, and uh, consequently, analytical approach is also improving. Uh, so, my report is about how you can level up your analytics and move from simple metrics to more complex stuff. At first, let's uh, discuss... Okay. At first, let's discuss uh, general metrics of your project. Uh, metrics which are known by everybody and used by everybody. We can divide them into three groups. First of all, it's product metrics, such as retention, daily play time, and many other product specific things. Uh, there is nothing to say more about them. The second group is monetization metrics. Um, depending on what type of income you have in your apps, we can, uh, we should divide them uh, by in-app purchases, ad monetization, and subscriptions. The main metric here is LTV, of course. We also uh, look at impressions, uh, daily impressions, cumulative impressions to a day X, and things like this. Uh, the third group is user acquisition metrics, such as CPI, CTR, conversion rate, install rate, ROI, organic percentage, they are pretty standard also. There is nothing much to add here. <laughs> there, are, uh, there are many benchmarks uh, on the market for these metrics. Uh, and of course, the bigger your metrics are, the better. But uh, you should remember that um, your main metric is ROI always. And if it's more than 100%, then your project can make profit. And uh, this can actually be achieved in many uh, different ways. Um, for example, you can have pretty low retention rate, but uh, your organic percentage will be very high, and that's great for your product. Or you can have low, uh, high CPI, but your LTV is even higher, and that also can result in good ROI. So the cases when some metrics are below benchmarks, but in the end your product shows a good profit are not un uncommon. For example, we have uh, Hair Tattoo Project and Bike Hope, which R1 is nearly 30% only, but uh, they can make a great profit by the end of their life cycle. Okay, uh, let's move to more complex things. Uh, how you can level up your analytics. Today I will talk about four themes. Um, I will talk about how you should work with funnels the right way, uh, with your ad monetization metrics, with technical metrics, and uh, the most interesting part, how to work with heat maps. Let's start with funnels. Um, funnels are a pretty common instrument in analytics. They are used for tracking churn rate uh, during tutorial stages or during level progression stages or in many other uh, cases. On the right side, you can see an example of a simple level progression funnel uh, in one of our games, but it uh, actually has not very much info in it. Uh, you can't get any insights from it. Uh, when we work with uh, level progression funnels, we add uh, more metrics to them. You can see them on the big table on the slide. Uh, first of all, we divide uh, our funnel into starting levels and finishing levels steps. Uh, why it's so important? Because it uh, allows us to, mm, to know where uh, people actually leave the game during level or between levels because uh, there are completely different reasons uh, when a user leaves game during level or between level. 
Speaking of reasons, uh, we also add uh, win rate and average time spent on level to our funnels, so we can uh, know precisely why user left because of a difficult level or it can be pretty long. Um, let's further discuss why it's so important to look at uh, step length when you work with churn rate. Take a look at this funnel. It's an example uh, for a city builder game or idler game on, or pretty much any game. Uh, on the first side, uh, it, uh, look like, it looks like that step four is the worst with 20% churn rate, uh, but it's actually not that clear. Uh, if, we, uh, if we add uh, time elapsed from install to this funnel, the things uh, become more complicated. Uh, yeah, it's 20% uh, churn rate on step four, while other steps has 10%, um, but uh, step four also took, uh, long, took more time to complete, so it seems pretty logical that more people will, uh, will leave the game uh, during a longer period of time. Uh, to make it more clear, let's put uh, all the points on the graphic where Y axis is percentage from install and X axis is time elapsed from install. Uh, now we can see that actually step four is uh, on the line with all, will, uh, with all other steps except step three, which is definitely below the line uh, because 10% uh, churn rate is, more, is uh, it's big for uh, only 30 seconds of gameplay, so you, actually should look for troubles there and not on step four. <sighs> Let's continue with uh, add monetization networks. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of monetization networks in our games and uh, advertising for, from uh, different networks can cause negative feedback for users. For example, some networks can have uh, problems with SDKs or problems with closing ad window, or they have can have just aggressive ads. Uh, to track this issue, we look at session closure rate, uh, and an example of this metric is on the table. That's uh, the real data from one of our games we had. Uh, to count the, this metric, we divide uh, impressions number which led to session closure into a total number of impressions uh, by this network. As you can see, uh, it's obvious that some of these networks uh, perform worse than others. Uh, so what we did here, we turned off uh, at network five and six completely, uh, and uh, it results in increasing retention and LTV by 10% respectively. Uh, usually, it's not uh, it's bad idea to turn off uh, ad networks completely because you, your CPM can drop. Uh, but in some cases, uh, increasing retention from disabling some networks can offset the eCPM drop and you will get profit. It's even better to turn uh, off only specific creatives which cause problems. Uh, but you should have a lot of, a lot of data for this. Uh, here it was particularly small project, so we didn't have that data and we ended up with uh, turning off completely to ad networks and still got a good profit. Problems. Ah, okay. Um, when analyzing ads, it's uh, also Im important to look at uh, impression distribution among users. Why it's important? Because uh, there are some cases when you have the same number of impressions per user on average, but uh, in the end, uh, you have uh, different LTV for these groups. Why it happens? Because uh, of eCPM fatigue with uh, every consecutive view for each user. For example, on this graphic, uh, group B, 
if you look at group B, uh, there are many users who haven't watched any ads, but there are also many users who watched a lot of ads. So in this case, uh, LTV in group B will be lower than in group A. And uh, that's why it's important to look at this distribution. Okay, let's move on to technical metrics. Uh, it's pretty obvious that technical health of your project uh, helps with the, your retention strongly and uh, consequently with monetization. Despite this fact, uh, uh, actually a few people pay attention to them. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, what do we mean by technical metrics? Uh, at first, it's FPS data, how smooth is your game works. Um, we track different statistics for FPS, like average, median levels. We also track number of FPS spikes, uh, periods of time when uh, your FPS, FPS uh, drops uh, below certain levels. Uh, we also track memory usage of the games uh, in the same manner. Mm. It's, it also can be pretty useful to send crashes uh, data to your analytics so you can know what specific events in game led to a crash. Uh, of course, you should also send them to some uh, crash specific tools like Crashlytics from Google. Uh, lastly, we use technical funnels to find problems uh, in our loading sequences. Uh, steps in this funnel are some important steps during loading process. For example, accepting permissions, loading different game resources, loading SDKs, uh, acquiring profile from server, and things like this. Uh, it uh, can really help you to find uh, problems if you see big churn rate between install and start of a tutorial. Uh, you should try looking at the technical funnel. You should also always track time uh, between uh, steps in this funnel because some steps can actually take more time than you expect them to take. Uh, Here's the example how we use technical metrics in a real life scenario in a World War Heroes game. It's a multiplayer shooter game. Uh, after releasing a new version of the game, we saw an increasing number of crashes. First of all, developers localized that most crashes connected to the memory usage. And uh, then analysts localized that uh, crashes occurring during battles mostly. Uh, we looked at the dependence of con consumed memory on the battle number and we found uh, memory leaks. Then we gathered some additional analytics about this. Uh, we specified maps where it happened, we specified game modes, and all that helped us to find a problem and fix it. And uh, we made a hotfix for a game. Uh, okay, the last thing, uh, heat maps. What is a heat map? A heat map is a graphical representation of data that uses uh, a system of color coding to represent different values. Here you can see some examples of uh, heat map usage. Uh, but when they actually come in handy, uh, surprisingly they can help you uh, with uh, your map design. Uh, you can study uh, player movement routes, sniper positions, gathering spots for players, uh, where pl players are stuck or where, where they leave uh, the game. Uh, you can also use heat maps to study interfaces in UI dependent games and apps uh, for, for example, uh, to know which UI elements are more used uh, and uh, where people tap on the screen. Um, we primarily use uh, heat maps on our mid-core projects, uh, but it doesn't, it, uh, doesn't mean that you can't use them anywhere else, even in hyper-casual, if you have uh, complex maps there.
Uh, okay. Uh, here's the example of how we used heat maps in the off-road simulator game. Uh, it's a game when you, where you need to drive a truck through a difficult terrain using transmission, gear shifting, and other nerdy trunk driving things. Uh, <laughs> we saw a significant churn between tutorial steps, uh, but we can't figure, figure out why. Uh, because uh, the map was very open and we had uh, very many theories about this. Uh, so we decided to use heat map to help us understand. Uh, what we did, we uh, sent player coordinates every three seconds or so to analytics. Uh, then we put these coordinates on a map screenshot. We, mar we marked the coordinate grid and counted the number of player events in each cell. Uh, the, more the, the more events happen in a particular spot, the brighter the correspondent cell. Uh, that's how it looked. You can see it on the left slide. Uh, intensive red areas on the left map are areas where people stuck the most. Knowing uh, these areas, we could uh, redesign the map. Uh, we add some tutorial tips there to help uh, people understand what they should do. Uh, we also segmented our tutorial into uh, difficult segments by color, and we found out that some players just ignore tutorial tips uh, and uh, go straight to the target goal, which uh, resulted in stacking. Uh, it's a screenshot of the game. Uh, blue line indicates uh, tutorial track from one checkpoint uh, to another, while uh, with their er red arrow points to a final goal. So some people uh, saw this goal from uh, the beginning and they went straight to it, and uh, they stuck in uh, rocks or something. <laughs> Uh, so we knew this um, only from using a heat map, and uh, that helped us uh, to fix these issues and increase uh, retention and uh, tutorial uh, progression by, I think, 15% or something. Okay, that's all for me.